Last week we began the first epistle of Peter. We covered the first two verses, which is the salutation of Peter to those sojourners of the dispersion who had been spread abroad through the world. We pointed out that the sojourners of the dispersion is a phrase that often refers to Jews, but was also a phrase that referred to the church. There came a very heavy persecution against the church in Jerusalem. Herod stretched forth his hand against the church and he killed James. The brother of John, when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he also placed Peter in prison, intending to bring him forth the next day. The Bible records in the book of Acts the persecution against the church there in Jerusalem. The result of the persecution was that Christians were spread abroad throughout the world. And so Peter is writing to them. As he writes to them, he calls them elect according to the foreknowledge of God. And so last week we dealt with the subject of election, God's foreknowledge. Now, as we get into verse 3, Peter declares, Blessed be God. The word that he uses for blessed here is a word that is used exclusively as far as God is concerned. This particular Greek word is never used for man. There's another Greek word when it is referring to the blessings of man. Same root, but a different form of the same Greek word. Blessed be God. how often we fail to give glory to God. And yet, that really is what it's all about. Paul speaks in Ephesians chapter 1 that we might be to the praise of the glory of His grace. He speaks in chapter 1 of the glorious spiritual blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. And these spiritual blessings are all to the intent that he might receive praise to the glory of his grace. In other words, God has done so much for you and he wants you to respond to it. And the truest praise is that natural response that arises in my heart when I become aware of the grace and the goodness of God, though I am so painfully conscious of how much I do not deserve it. Yet God is good to me. God, I don't deserve it. Oh, Lord, you're so good. You know, as, as God has just laid some blessing upon you or an understanding of his grace or of his love or his mercy and, and, and he manifests his love for you and you say, oh Lord, thank you, you're so good. And it's that automatic kind of a responding to God. That's the truest form of praise. Now, there is often an attempt for us to get God to respond to us. So that I have been in services where they said, now let's all praise the Lord, now let's lift up our hands and praise the Lord in order that we might receive a blessing. You see, let's start praising the Lord so God will respond to our praises and bless us. Now let's give so that God will bless us. 
Let's work for God so that he can bless us. And the idea is, is something that I might do for God to create a response from God to me. There are people that are like this, you know. When they come around and they say, you know, I've just been thinking so much about you lately. I really think that you're one of the finest people I know. And as they start buttering you up, you, you begin to uh, wonder what kind of a response are they wanting from me? You know that there's a certain, that there is an ulterior motive in their, in their praise of you. Now, when you are aware that the person is not being genuine or sincere, they're not just saying that, not looking for anything in return, but they're only saying it because they are looking for something in return. You know that they're buttering you up for pretty, you know, you keep waiting for the hook, you know, all right. Fine, now, what do you want, you know? Somehow, you almost resent their flattery because it lacks sincerity because you know that they are only saying that because they want to get something from you. You try on a coat in the store and the salesman says, oh, that looks so good. My, you look so thin in that. My, what a beautiful fit, you know. You look so much younger and all. You say, shut your mouth, man. You don't, you know, you're only trying to sell me the jacket. I know that. <laughs> that kind of flattery I can live without because it isn't sincere. Now, if we are only praising God in order that God might bless us, you have the same kind of a concept. The praise isn't necessarily sincere. It isn't really... God isn't really the object then of my praise. I'm the object of my praise because I want God to respond and do something for me. When we praise God, he should be the object and the end of the praise. I should never be praising God with the idea of, well, now, if I praise the Lord, then God is going to respond to me and bless me and all because I'm praising him. And, and that, you see, brings it back to me, and I become the object of my praise. So the truest praise is that which actually just sort of spontaneously arises out of my soul when I see the goodness of God. Oh, Lord, you're so far out. I can't believe it. I love you, Lord, you know. And, and I'm responding to God. And I'm not looking for God now to say, oh, isn't that, did you hear what he said? Oh, isn't that wonderful? Let's see what we can do for him, you know. <laughs> Blessed be God. And the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. It is important, again, that we realize that the word Lord, kurios, is not a name in the New Testament. Now, in the Old Testament, the word Lord when it is in all capital letters, is a name. It stands for that name of God which the Jews felt was so holy that it should never cross the lips of a mortal man. A name that they felt was so holy that they would not write it 
in their manuscripts that incommunicable name of God. And because they did not write the vowels, only the consonants, Y-H-V-H, it left it unpronounceable. How would you pronounce Y-H-V-H? Try to pronounce that. <laughs> they left out the vowels so that you couldn't pronounce it. So the pronunciation is sort of left in ambiguity, actually, as far as if it is Yahweh or Jehovah, we don't know. But capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D is written in our text to signify that the consonants YHVH, which stands for the name of God. Now, in the eighth Psalm, we have an interesting example of, of uh, the use of it. O Lord, our Lord. Now, there are two Hebrew words there that are translated Lord. The name for God, the Y-H-V-H, -H, O Jehovah, our Lord, Adonai. Now, Adonai is equivalent to the New Testament kurios, which is a title not a name. And so here the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord being his title, which signifies my relationship to him. Now it is important that you have this relationship to him. It is important that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. Which means that you are his bond slave, his servant. Which means that you have renounced rights of self-determination. And you've submitted those to him and now you are his to obey whatever he might desire without question, without argument, without hesitation. We use the term Lord so glibly. We talk about, oh, the Lord, oh, bless the Lord. Oh, the Lord's been so good. Oh, the good Lord, you know. And we use the term so glibly that it doesn't really signify to us the true meaning of the word. We use it as a name rather than as a title. But it is so important that we use it as a title and that it is meaningful to us as a title that we think of it as a title. I think of my relationship. He is the Lord of my life. He has absolute rights over me. He can order me to do whatever he wants me to do, and I have no right to question it, challenge it. And yet, whenever I find myself in the position of challenging, hesitating, questioning the command, and still I use the term Lord, Jesus brought up the inconsistency. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet you don't do the things I command you? What's wrong with you? You go around calling me Lord, Lord, and yet you're not obeying me. You're not doing the things I tell you to do. That's inconsistent. That's because you're using Lord as a name, not a title. It's important that you use the term Lord. For if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, 
Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's, it's a part of salvation. It's important to salvation. It's essential to salvation. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. In that day many will come unto me saying, Lord, Lord. He said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of the Father, not just mouthing a term, a name, or as a name, but signifying a true relationship that I have committed my life to him. When Peter was there in Joppa on that roof praying about lunchtime, the house of Simon the Tanner. And he had this vision, and he saw the sheet let down from heaven with all manner of animals on it, clean, unclean, creeping things. And the Lord said to Peter, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord. Yes, you see the inconsistency. You can't say that. That's a totally inconsistent sentence or statement. Not so, Lord. No, that's impossible. That's that, that just is an inconsistent statement. If the Lord commands me to do something, if he is indeed the Lord... The only thing I can say, yes, Lord. <laughs> That's the only consistent response I can have to him is that of immediate, absolute, unquestioned obedience. That's my relationship. The Lord, Jesus Christ. So blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, <laughs> according to his abundant mercy, not according to our sweetness and our deserving and our merits and our promises and our vows and our dedication and our obedience, but according to his abundant mercy, he has begotten us again. You see, it, it, it has nothing to do with me yet. This is all God's business so far. I haven't had a thing to do with it yet. For he elected me. I didn't have anything to do with him electing me. He elected me according to his foreknowledge. That's, that's his. Nothing me, on my part yet. Now, according to his abundant mercy, he has begotten me again. Or, if you please, and it, it is, it's, a, it's a difficult phrase to translate, but he has born me again. Or he's talking about the born again experience. I have been born again by God because of his abundant mercy. And Peter here is talking about the born-again experience. That second birth that Jesus said was essential if I was to enter into the kingdom of heaven. To Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, he said, ye must be born again. Now, John tells us that we were born 
not of corruptible seed, that is our new birth, nor by the will of man, nor by the will of the flesh, but by God. My new birth is God's work. It wasn't the will, really, of man. Now, so often we are emphasizing the will of man. And it is scriptural that we must exercise our capacity of choice. There is human responsibility, and you cannot deny that truth, but we're not dealing with that side of the truth at the present moment. We're dealing with God's side of the truth. Later on, we'll deal with man's side of the truth, but presently, we're dealing with God's side. You say, but how do you reconcile it? You don't. You leave that to God because you'll never be able to reconcile God's election and your free moral agency. God's sovereignty and your human responsibility, you'll never be able to reconcile those. So we're looking at God's side right now. I have been born again, not by the will of man, nor by the will of the flesh, but by the will of God. So Peter, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has begotten us again or brought us into this born-again experience by his abundant mercy. You see, it's all on God's part. It's his abundant mercy. It's his work in me. Now, being born again, I have a glorious hope. Peter is called the apostle of hope. Paul was the apostle of grace. John the apostle of love. But Peter is called the apostle of hope where he was always talking about the hope of the believer. Now, Paul also spoke a lot about the hope of the believer. But here, Peter refers to our hope as a living hope. Paul tells us in Ephesians that at one time as Gentiles, we were without God, without hope in this world. And we have talked to you on the importance of hope in a person's life. There are many mysterious deaths for which there seems to be no apparent physical cause. And many of these deaths are attributed to the fact that the person just lost hope. Hope is such an important thing for survival. I spoke to you once about the psychological testing of wharf rats. Where they put them in water spraying water constantly in it so that they couldn't roll over and float for they tried to the water would go up their nostrils. Seeing how long they could survive in water before they drowned. And they found that these rats would drown in an average of 17 minutes. But then in the special experimental group of rats, they put them in the same condition, and at about 16 minutes, as the rats were just about to drown, they would pick them out of the water, wipe them off with a towel, 
and nursed them back to health. And after they were healthy again, they put them back in the water in the same conditions. And they found now that these rats who had once been rescued could survive for 35 hours. And the psychologist said the reason being is that they had had a born-again experience. <laughs> You see, they were going down, <laughs> they were about to drown, and having been rescued, what it did was place a hope in them. So when put back in the same conditions, they were now hoping again for the rescue, and that hope kept them going from 17-minute average to a 35-hour average. The power of hope. It is that hope that we have through the born-again experience that keeps us going in this topsy-turvy world, that keeps us going in the midst of trial, that keeps us going in the midst of suffering, in the midst of hardships. We go and we continue to go because we have that glorious hope within our hearts. God has lifted us out before. He's brought us out of every situation up till now. I know he's going to bring me out of this. And I keep treading water, waiting for God to reach down and lift me out and to rescue me. And so the Christian has something that the world doesn't have, and that is a hope. As the world looks at the crisis tonight, they see the things that are happening, and there is so little hope for any solution. Just when we get a little bit of an oil glut, and maybe gas prices are going to go down a couple cents, what happens? They start blowing up the refineries and the oil fields and cutting off the Straits of Hormuz. And now it looks like, you know, this oil glut surplus is going to be depleted and prices are... Oh, no, just when I began to see a little light, it snuffed out. But as a Christian, I look at the whole thing entirely differently. I say, wow, <laughs> not going to have to worry about oil gluts or shortages much longer. <laughs> All right, you know, getting close. The hope, the sustaining hope. Now, Peter calls it a living hope. I would hate to hope that Buddha <laughs> could raise me from the dead. He couldn't do it for himself. <laughs> you see, who else? Mohammed, who else can give you a living hope? Some may give you the hope that you might come back the next time as a cow and live more contentedly. <laughs> but the hope of eternal life, the hope of the resurrection from the dead, is the hope that God has given to us tonight, but the basis of that hope, the thing that makes that hope living, is the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. 
So we've been born again, first of all, to a life of hope, a living hope, and the basis of that living hope is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now Paul said, if Christ be not risen, then we who, we are still in our sins. And those who have died in Jesus are perished. And we, really if our hope is only in Christ in this world only, we're of all men to be pitied the most. But our hope is a living hope of that eternal life that has been promised to us by Jesus Christ. And I've been born again into this living hope. The new spiritual life, the new spiritual man that I am has this glorious hope and the assurance of the hope because Jesus rose from the dead. So the world is divided into two categories of people, those who have hope and those who have no hope. Those who have a living hope and those that hope that their hopes are all right. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath begotten us again according to his abundant mercies unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But I've been born again, and because I've been born again, I'm in a new family. And as a member of this new family, I'm actually now an heir. During my many years of poverty, I would read stories of people who had a knock on the door and there was an attorney and said, is your name such and such? And <laughs> Well, you had a great uncle, you know, who was a wealthy millionaire and he died and uh, we've been searching for you, you know. And I used to go through this, uh, the list of missing persons, you know, uh, hoping that I would find my name, only knowing that my name was so common. If I did find it, it probably wouldn't mean anything anyhow. But uh, thinking how glorious it would be to uh, suddenly find yourself an heir to uh, a fortune. Because there was a time in my life when I thought money would solve all of my problems. And, and as a child, you sort of fantasize how nice it would be to be an heir. You know, you see the pictures of, of the little kids riding ponies on the estates and, and this kind of stuff. And you think, oh my, you know, is the... Butler is out there, you know, telling him time to come in for dinner, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And you think, wow, you know, how nice. But being born again, I, I have become an heir. Paul said, beloved, now are we the sons of God. And if sons, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So, I have been born again unto a living hope to an inheritance. I have a glorious inheritance. Now, the interesting thing, there's a little, a little twist on this inheritance. Usually someone has to die before you receive your inheritance. And of course, Jesus did die, and, and it is through his death that is the basis of our inheritance. I've been born again through him. But yet, I don't enter into my inheritance, really, the fullness of it. Now, I do have now 
a portion of it, but the fullness of it I won't receive until I die. You see, right now I am still a sojourner, as he wrote to those sojourners of the dispersion. I'm still a pilgrim in this area. My treasures really aren't on this earth. And I'm glad for that. Because if my treasures were upon this earth, then they would always be in danger of either my own folly and stupidity and losing them all, or being stolen. But I have an inheritance. A glorious inheritance. I am an heir of God. Now, the scripture teaches a double inheritance. In Ephesians, Paul speaks of another inheritance. Not yours, but God's. Paul was praying for the Ephesians. Number one, that they might know what is the hope of their calling. Oh, if you only knew <laughs> what a glorious hope you have now that you've been called of God. You've been elected by God. Oh, what a hope is yours. If you only knew, God opened their eyes, give them spiritual understanding and enlightenment that they may know what is the hope of their calling and what is the exceeding richness of God's inheritance in the saints. Wait a minute. I know my inheritance. But what about God's inheritance? What he is saying is, if you only knew how much God values you. If you only knew what a treasure you are to him. Now we read of, this, of the treasures in Christ Jesus and, and all, but there's another part to this because God looks upon you as a valuable treasure for him. And God treasures you. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man going through a field and discovering a treasure and who for the joy thereof immediately goes out and sells everything in order that he might buy the field so that he can obtain the treasure. That parable has been misinterpreted many times. I used to have a fabulous sermon on that parable <laughs> that as I read it more carefully after years, I had to discard. I had a professor in seminary who told us, do not try to preach on the parables until you've been pastoring for 20 years. But what do professors know? <laughs> and so as I started in the ministry, I had one especially dynamic sermon on the parable of the kingdom of heaven. The man going through a field and discovering a treasure. You see, I had heard so many people say what they had given up when they came to Jesus Christ. I had heard so many, you know, of these testimonies of giving up fortunes and giving up fame and giving up careers, you know. I could have been a Hollywood movie star and all this kind of stuff, you know, I gave it all up. 
And, and I had a wealthy uncle that one time said that he would put me through college to get my law degree if I just give up the idea of the ministry. And I was real thankful that he offered me that because then I have my testimony of what I gave up, you know. <laughs> but I use this message to sort of turn that around. Look, hey, you haven't given up anything. It's what you've gained. And so I would try to apply this parable, say that uh, we were walking through the field next door here and we stumble over something and as we pick ourselves up, so we look back to see what we stumble over and here's a piece of metal or something and we kick the dirt away and it looks like a lid and so we get a shovel and we pry the lid open and oh man, Captain Kidd <laughs> left some loot here in the field. So what do we do? We cover it back over, put the grass back. And we go down to the county courthouse. We find out who owns the field. We go to them and we say, what would you want for that field you've got over there? I want to buy it. And we're insistent. We don't take no for an answer. I want to buy it. You name your price. So I get him to finally name a price for the field and I put an ad in the paper for my Chevy. <laughs> and I take my Timex down to the pawn shop and see how much he'll give me for it. And I, you know, I scrimp, I, I sell everything I've got. Get the cash, come back and lay it on the line. I get the deed in my hand, put it in my pocket, I get my shovel, I go back and I uncover this chest of rubies and the whole bit. I cash it in. Now, do I go back and try to find the guy that bought my Timex watch so I can buy it back from him? No way. Do I try to find a guy that bought my old Chevy car that was needing a ring job? No way. <laughs> See, now I'm buying little Mercedes 450. And <laughs> so that someone says, oh, man, what a beautiful little car. That's all right. Oh, but man, you don't know what I had to give up to get this. <laughs> and you see, it made a neat sermon. But it's wrong. <laughs> it's a misapplication of the parable. Jesus wasn't talking about us discovering a treasure. For the field, he said, is the world. I didn't have to sell everything to buy the world. He's the one that gave everything to purchase the world. He's the one that wanted the treasure. And the treasure was us. Those whom he foreknew. Those whom he chose to be his children, to take them out of the world, to give them a hope, to make them heirs. And he treasured you so highly, he gave everything to purchase the world, not because he needed a world, but because he wanted the treasure in it. So the inheritance is both ways. God looks upon you, and Peter's going to tell us 
uh, how that God looks upon you and he calls you his peculiar treasure. I can buy that. <laughs> it's peculiar to me that God would treasure me. That God would put so much value in me. That to me is peculiar. I can't understand why God loves me so much, why God values me so highly. I can't understand that. And so God looks at you as his inheritance, but then in turn, I also have a glorious inheritance. So I have been born again to this living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Being born again, now in the family of God, I have an inheritance. And my inheritance is, first of all, incorruptible in contrast to earthly inheritances that are so corruptible and are so corrupting. Some people, the worst thing that ever happened to them was to get money. Inheritances have corrupted so many people. But my inheritance is incorruptible. It's undefiled. And it fadeth not away. And it is reserved in heaven for me. So this glorious inheritance I have is really far out. Now, if you were Bunker Hunt's in error, <laughs> and you were just thinking, oh, my, you know, when they die, ooh-wee. <laughs> and then after this silver experiment, in, when the, in which they lost estimated billion dollars. That's all you think, oh, no, my inheritance is fading away. <laughs> and you'd be watching the stock market every day to see how much your inheritance is fading. But hey, not my heavenly inheritance. Fades not away. It's reserved in heaven for me, for you, who are kept by the power of God. In Jude we read, Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. I've had so many people say, Well, I'd like to be a Christian. I've thought about it. And I've seriously considered it. But I don't want to start anything I can't finish. <laughs> and I don't think that I can maintain that Christian life. I don't think I can keep it up. I'd like to be a Christian, but I, I'm just afraid I, you know, I, I just am afraid that I wouldn't be able to keep it up. Unto you who are kept by the power of God. It doesn't talk about you keeping yourself or you keeping it up. It's talking about God's ability to keep you. Now, I want you to notice something here. Peter has been talking to us about what God has done for you. It comes back to blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this is all God, what God has done, what God is, what God has planned. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has begotten you again by his abundant mercy unto this living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, phased not away, that is reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God. but don't I have something to do with it? Not up to this point. I've been elected according to his foreknowledge, been born again, been given a living hope, 
been given an inheritance, and now he's keeping me. Oh, but surely there's something for me. Yes, there is. Just read on the next part, through faith. There you are. You've got it. Your part. All right. Hop on. <laughs> you mean, can't I do something? Yes, you bet you can. You can believe in God's love and in God's goodness and in God's mercy and in his grace for you. But that's all. That's all that God requires, that you just simply believe him to do what he said he is going to do. All of this is mine through faith. That's all that God requires, through faith. The Bible always deals with God's part and man's part. Because there is God's part and there is man's part. As God deals with the two aspects, he always emphasizes and puts his part first and our part second. A great mistake of many ministers is that in considering God's part and man's part, we are prone to put man's part first and emphasize it and God's part last. Praise the Lord so that he will bless you. Man's part first. No. God always puts his part first. Now, think back for a moment on all of the sermons you've heard on what you ought to be doing for the Lord, on your responsibilities to God, on your faithfulness to God, on your service to the Lord, on what you should be because you're a Christian, what you should be doing. And all of the messages that you've heard that dealt with your part, As I was growing up, that's all I ever heard. I can't remember any sermon that really brought me comfort. They always brought me conviction. Because I wasn't living up to my part. But I wanted to. But I didn't know how. You see, I was trying to keep myself righteous, keep myself holy, keep myself pure instead of allowing God to keep me because all I'd heard is my part, not his. But the scripture always emphasizes and places the greatest importance on God's part, even as we read here. Go through it again and read all that God has done, and then we get to your part through faith. Just believing in God's marvelous work. Shall we pray? Father, we're so grateful for all that you have done. Oh, how thankful we are, Father. With Peter, we join in 
are exclamations of blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you have worked in us a new life through the new birth. By the will of God, we've been born again. Thank you for the living hope Thank you for the glorious inheritance. Thank you for your keeping power tonight. Father, we just commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name.